Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines here. We've all heard the catchphrases, flip the switch, big bang cut over, and everybody's like, yeah, well, nothing's happened. Well, let me ask a question. Would it matter to you if Swift was now using those terms? Yeah, I thought so. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and digperspectives.com for exclusive content at the top of the screen. $2.54 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is off by 4.6%. Uh, 63,400 plus for Bitcoin right now, 3,300 plus for Ethereum, 103.1 billion plus market cap for Tether, 60 cents for XRP, off by 1.6 on the 24, off by 2.6 on the seven day. Range of price very quickly between 61 cents on the bottom, 65 cents on the top. We are at the bottom range right now. The entire movie, uh, excuse me, the entire market is moving in the wrong direction, but we will keep an eye on it. Take a look at this rate quickly here. I want to remind you about the Future of Digital Assets Benefit Dinner, where you can have private dinner with Brad Garlinghouse, Michael Arrington, John Deaton, the Honorable Chris Giancarlo, and others. And let me tell you something. DAI is going to be there. That's right. The digital asset investor, the GOAT himself and myself will be at this dinner. And we are going to have a wonderful time. And I hope you will get a ticket because here's the beautiful part. You can get a charitable donation to the Digital Chamber, which is the Digital Chamber of Commerce. They're rebranding. And you can help support them. And it's a tax write-off. So this is just a beautiful way to have private dinner with Brad and all these other incredible guests, as well as have a charitable donation to help the fight to stop the crypto ban on Capitol Hill and help Perry Ann and the crew over there, as well as get something for yourself and have a tax donation in the process and a tax write-off. So, so don't mess around and get your ticket, general admission ticket before they run out get a room right at the mgm grand stay at the facility it's a beautiful facility we love it over there and they have some of the best dining and restaurants you can imagine the food and all the shops that they have there's so much to do it's its own little city and you can go right from your room to the conference it's going to be a wonderful time now today is a very special day because automated market makers go live today yes i'm super excited because forevermore the way the xrp ledger was yesterday it'll never be the same going forward from today it is that remarkable what's happening ladies and gentlemen and i cannot wait to see as this all comes together and develops if it comes together without any issues which it shouldn't have and i'm sure if it does they'll be worked out over time but as it develops, I have to wonder how this will look to the eyes of a regulator. You know, let us not forget the way the eyes of the regulator is now seeing Ethereum much different from proof of stake to proof of work or proof of work to proof of stake. But here we see uh, CTO David Schwartz debuts trading bot based on XRP Ledger automated market maker. He said, I spent two weekends implementing a trading bot that uses an algorithm that's as close to the XRP Ledger's automated market maker algorithm as possible to trade on centralized exchanges. Here's its trading Solana. And then he shows it down here, trading uh, more clearly in Solana with the font change, and then ETH, and then Bitcoin, and Solana and ETH. So this is really cool. And then somebody says, is it profitable from VET? And then David Schwartz says, it's too early to say with high confidence, but it looks like we, it would make about 11% per year. Whoa! But it's really hampering by the trading fees it has to pay. You can see from the log that it, can, it can't take advantage of smaller price movements and so misses a lot of volatility. So with that, uh, Angie asked down here, David, what's the ultimate advice for someone diving into the world of AMMs for the first time, eager to join the action? David says, I would say to go slow, especially given the automated or the XRP Ledger's AMM implementation is brand new to handling real value. It's going to be here for a long time, so no rush to dive in first minute. And that's how I've been approaching this as well. Super excited about this, but I want to learn about it. And if I do decide to do it, I want to make sure that I'm using something that's an acceptable test size for myself. So in other words, whatever I decide to use, 
If it doesn't work out for me, I'm not going to be upset because I already planned on making that investment regardless of it going well or not. So maybe that's something you guys want to consider as you move into it too. Super excited. But to add to this whole automated market makers going live today, not only will David Schwartz be on stage, but this is why I tell you this is going to be one of the most important conferences you're ever going to attend because of the timing of it all. This is not a mistake. Listen, you know, automated market makers going live here. We're going to have Moy Finance on stage at XRP Las Vegas. They're going to be participating in automated market makers because they're set up for it right now. So, you know, we're going to hear from somebody who can offer that to people on stage at XRP Las Vegas. Not to mention the fact we're going to hear from David Schwartz even further about what he's going to learn between now and May about the automated market makers and any new features that he's excited about of the ever-expanding ledger. So I cannot wait. I, you guys can tell how excited I am. I hope you get your ticket and come. It's going to be a wonderful time. However, this guy says it right here. He's talking about a white swan, not a black swan. And he says, just like we do here on the channel, that white swan would be regulation. And so if we were to get a market structure bill in the U.S., which I think is one of probably the biggest white swans that could happen to our industry is just regulatory clarity on whether certain tokens or securities or commodities, how they should operate, what it takes to be an ATS venue. I think that's a big unlock. And if you can get some of the larger market participants, the Fidelities and the Black Rocks and some of the larger custodians behind a market structure bill, uh, then I think you really start to see this real world asset narrative get some legs in a way that it hasn't. And, and, and I think that's 100 percent spot on. That's what we've been saying here, right? And you know what? We know that we're closer than ever in the United States because we've heard all the all the people talk about it. Janet Yellen just recently, as a couple of weeks ago, said that crypto or stable coins are a national security issue. Well, that's not something that Congress can turn a blind eye to. You just don't get to willy nilly turn your blind turn your head to national security risk or issues, right? They have to be dealt with. So. Look at this really quickly here as City and Brazilian Development Bank have joined the Hyperledger Foundation to work collaboratively on fostering enterprise grade services and solutions using blockchain technology. When you go into this, first of all, we know City and Brazil has deep relationships with uh, Ripple. And we know here the Hyperledger Foundation is a global ecosystem for enterprise blockchain for anybody who's not aware of that. Uh, technology, which currently has 134 supporting members. So it's a giant foundation of a bunch of traditional financial institutions like banks and what have you, as well as new payment providers like Ripple and others, right? So I just wanted to share that. And right now, this is being built with Besu, which is an open source Ethereum client. So I wanted to make that clear for everybody. And you have to wonder, how does this shake out if we see Ethereum end up becoming a security uh, we know what a hurdle it was going to be for Ripple over XRP to not be used if it ended up being security in the payments world. So you have to wonder how this will be working out if it goes that way. Will this city Brazilian development bank continue to work with uh, Ethereum's client? Uh, you know what I mean? Or will they have to move to other protocols? And meanwhile, we see here longtime Ripple partner Thune's Payment has announced an expanded strategic partnership with, you guessed it, Visa. <laughs> Love hearing this. This move deepens ties with Visa to expand digital wallet access across Asia and Africa. With Visa Direct's push to card feature, payouts to over 190 countries and territories are streamlined. This collaboration taps into the surging popularity of digital assets expected to reach 60% global adoption by 2026. Wow. By leveraging Thune's vast network and Visa's expertise, this partnership aims to revolutionize global money movement, catering evolving consumer demands in an increasingly digital world. Well said there. And no issue there, right? Because there was no free pass. Yeah, we did it the old-fashioned way. We earned it. Yeah, that's right. And then here I want to bring you <laughs> at, about, uh, at about a minute 15 here. Let me bring this in. And you're going to hear inside of the European Parliament, this is the woman from Standard Chartered Bank here telling you about the years-long relationship with Ripple when it comes to crypto assets and this new technology. ...towards crypto assets. I think... <laughs> 
Standard Chartered is, is, is maybe a slight outlier here in that our, our fee, we do have live crypto asset initiatives, and I'm talking crypto assets here, not tokenized um, traditional assets. We already have a live crypto asset custodian and a live crypto asset um, brokerage and exchange, again, through our Standard Chartered Ventures arms, and we will soon be launching crypto asset custody um, in Dubai as well. Um, and the reason for that, we don't necessarily think crypto assets is the end game. We are sort of, I think, aligned with other with other peers in that we do think tokenized traditional assets is, is is more the end game. But the learning that we've gone through as an institution through getting these crypto asset um, initiatives off the ground, and frankly, that's where the liquidity is at the at the moment, and, and hence there is some commercial opportunity there. The learning that we've gone through from a risk management perspective is um, is really quite something. And I think about our first foray into crypto assets, which was our first investment in Ripple in 2016. And our, our whole risk management framework in regards to digital assets has, has incrementally enhanced year on year. The learning that we've gone through has been um, hugely, hugely valuable, and we hope sort of sets us up in, in pretty good stead. So I think the, um, what, what, so the, the point I'm coming to is the, the regulatory attitudes and I think the political um, rhetoric around crypto assets and digital assets is, is actually possibly more important than the actual regulation itself. Um, we have not yet come across any genuine regulatory blockers that have prevented us from moving forward in the endeavors that we, we want to explore. And there you have it. And they don't have any hurdles in front of them because they've been partnered with Ripple since 2016. Ripple is obviously on the final leg of getting that legal finality in every different area of the case. You know, there's only the one little area left here. So uh, we're going to get that clarity, ladies and gentlemen. That's happening, okay? Judge Torres said XRP in and of itself is not a security. Let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Then here's the big socket to me punch today. It's coming from Wrath of Common and Swift, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Today, Swift proposed a shared ledger. You know, like the one that we hear the BIS talk about all the time, a unified ledger. Uh-huh, that one. Uh, for payment data using blockchain technology, they suggest their transaction manager discuss the benefits, DVP, it's heady stuff. This discussion is sure to raise lots of questions for XRP Ledger and Ripple fans. Let's get into it because he's absolutely right. The need for rich data in their shared ledger par paradigm. The concept of a new universal shared ledger for digital payments and assets is gaining interest as a way of transforming how transactions are recorded and settled. When combined with a messaging layer, a shared ledger could create a powerful proposition capable of supporting the rich structure data exchange needed for transactions in regulated assets or money. Now, Going back through this, it talks about the uh, BIS, as we covered here, the annual economic report for 23, and its blueprint for a future of monetary system, envisioning uh, uh, a new type of financial market infrastructure, a unified ledger. We've covered this multiple times, which could capture the full benefits of tokenization. Other industry bodies have also been exploring the potential of a shared ledger. Monetary Authority of Singapore, for which Ripple is also a partner with, right? Isn't that funny? It's Global Layer 1, GL1 initiative to facilitate seamless cross-border transactions using an open digital infrastructure. Other notable initiatives include IMF, for we know they have a relationship and certainly well aware of Ripple, and the work being done by a broad set of banks in regulated liability networks. And we know that these are the big, deep networks for the banks on the back end, RLNs, regulated liability networks. So what is a shared ledger? Excuse me, the concept of a shared ledger represents a shift in the way financial systems book or books or records are kept. It says today's financial institutions, financial markets, infrastructures record transactions separately on their own databases, use a messaging structure to reconcile instruction or instruct positions across different records of value. Now, it goes on to say here, and you're going to love this, all right, stay with me here. ISO 20022 based on message, uh, based messaging layer will enhance the shared ledger proposition by offering a payload of rich structured data to fulfill adjacent functions that are essential to completion of any regulated financial transactions in an instant and frictionless way. 
Now, this reminds me exactly of XRP Ledger, what Ripple have been doing and the market infrastructure they've been building for over a decade. Does it not? Listen to this part. This is where it sounds very simple. Now, it does not say in here, for clarity, it does not say Ripple or XRP Ledger, but knowing what we've known for years and years and years, how can we not watch this and say this could possibly be a relationship with XL, XL, uh, 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 XRP Ledger or Ripple, obviously, directly, and then XLM and Stellar as well, right? So, But, but listen to this part. This part's pretty remarkable. Operating on a real-time 24-7 basis, a, such a shared ledger would uh, could offer instantaneous movement of value and native atomic settlement for delivery versus payment, which is what D versus P is, right? Payment versus payment transactions while reducing the need for reconciliation between financial institutions, getting rid of that friction. There could also be an opportunity to build additional services on top of the shared platform which is why I believe the XRP ledger has been waiting to get that final legal clarity before doing such a thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm injecting my own speculation here, as you know. So now here we look at this, defining the future of tokenization. One way the future of tokenization could be realized is with a big bang transition towards a shared ledger paradigm. Alternatively, it could take the form of more gradual path and multiple shared ledgers coexisting with traditional systems. Now that absolutely sounds like the XRP ledger to me because the XRP ledger, according to what I've learned and in conjunction with the interledger protocol would allow multiple shared ledgers, blockchain distributed ledger technology, as well as coexist with traditional payment systems that exist today. So that sounds very similar, and I don't know many other protocols that have that kind of capability. So it's just one of a few. But again, to speak to this, a shared ledger is what makes sense to me because it's a multi-world ledger, or multi-world ledger, jeez, uh, I can't even say it. It's a multi-ledger world after all, right? Say that five times fast. I, I can't, maybe you can't. But nevertheless, this looks a lot like where we want to go. And I remind everybody with Big Bang Transition, remember Victoria Cleland, long-term partner to the Bank of England. She told us a Big Bang cutover in 2019, 2020, but then the pandemic happened, right? What else do we know? James Wallace told us that Enbridge is in fact... Uh, the XRP ledger is, in fact, one of those pilots of Enbridge, if not the pilot of Enbridge. And we know that XRP serves as a bridge currency in that model. And it serves by connecting multiple ledgers. And why would you connect multiple ledgers to the XRP ledger? Because it has a decentralized exchange. Mic drop. That's where we are. And then I want to leave you with this. We're going to listen to Mr. Christian Carlo today tell you about how you could get that done between the government and a private enterprise, a quasi-like government involvement. Take a listen. This is remarkable. Our proposals, I think, is a quite simple one, and that is that there be a independent um, uh, um, enterprise. And now it can be a quasi-governmental, there's, there's certainly a role for strict standards and government uh, role in this, but having been in the government, knowing how difficult it is to actually do technological innovation in government, being a representative of government that couldn't build a medical website. That's right. Uh, and after three tries, eventually went to the private sector to get it done. If this has really got to be built, if it's going to be built on time and built, it's got to be built with private sector involvement. I don't think you could say it any better. And obviously, if you don't know, this is the Honorable Christian Carlo, former CFTC chairman, as well as the co-founder of the Digital Dollar Project. And again, 
This man is going to be on stage at XRP Las Vegas. Why are we having him there? Because I certainly understand that this is the greatest financial paradigm shift in the history of mankind, and it cannot be overstated. And we are going to bring that to a head at XRP Las Vegas. And the conversation we're going to have is going to be much deeper on exactly what he's talking about here, about that public-private relationship and what it will take to help ensure that the U.S dollar is dominant for the next 100 150 years to go all right look we're going into the freedom zone not financial advice from me or anyone else i hope you will join us you're going to want to be inside of here we're going to jump down into this ethereum ethgate business and what's going on here and we're going to hear from one of the powerful investigators and slews in this area and you know because of censorship issues i just I don't feel comfortable digging into these topics anymore on social media. So we're going to do it here in the Freedom Zone. You can join us at digperspectives.com. All you got to do is click the Freedom Zone button and come on in.